get going. Uh, so uh, I'm uh, happy to be with you again and uh, uh, welcome. And I'm really uh, enthusiastic about kicking off uh, another module of this course. Um, last time we had a, a topic that sort of stood on its own, but now we're embarking on a topic that's going to follow us through several successive lectures. Um, and uh, these lectures will cover different components of the broad topic of, of um, the interface between uncertainty on the one hand and agent-based models on the other. Uh, this is a broad topic and uh, I'll try to do it justice by talking about different, different aspects of uncertainty and models. Uh, and as we'll see, it, it is uh, many different components, some of which we'll only be able to, to touch on in this course, but which form more central topics in, in some of my other teaching, such as the interface between uh, uh, data science and, and machine learning on the one hand and, uh, and dynamic modeling and agent-based modeling in particular. But let's let's jump into this. And so I'm going to be starting with these slides on uncertainty and agent-based models. And we're going to spend a couple minutes here kind of situating us for, um, for the coming module um, in this course. So uh, agent-based models um, uh, form a, a textured form of modeling with um, many particular uh, aspects to it. And one of them, as we'll see, is uh, the presence of stochastics, uh, the common presence, though not universal, of uh, variability in model outputs. And, and that's going to be the first topic we're going to talk about today, um, the impacts of stochastic variability um, in modeling. Um, why we have stochastics in models. And given that stochastics induce different model results for the same model, same assumptions in terms of parameters, same structure, we still get different results. How do we, we grapple with that model? Um, that's gonna be the, the focus of today, but it's that's just one piece of a much broader enterprise related to this interaction of uncertainty and age-based models. And I've, I've tried to indicate here several other subtopics, many of which we'll be discussing uh, in coming lectures. So uh, a second one, uh, also more at a basic level and a familiar topic in dynamic modeling in general is the issue of parameter uncertainty. Um, and, uh, you know, this goes back to that old chestnut that I've warned about, warned about before, where people say, well, garbage in, garbage out, you know, you can get anything out of your model if you put different data into it. You know, why is this modeling um, offer any particular insights? It's just a kind of some arbitrary function of what you put in. And I, I noted that 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 um, sort of trite characterization of it belies the fact that models are more than their quantitative assumptions about their parameters. Uh, the, the more fundamental thing about models is, is actually their structure, um, the, uh, the, the stages of, of illness, for example, people can go through in their relationship with one another. Um, the ways in which different state charts interact um, and capture aspects of, uh, of state and, and the evolution of a person. But there's no question that parameters and uncertainty about parameters induces on its own some uncertainty about model results. If, if you're not sure what values parameters have, that's going to have some some derived uncertainty it's going to impose on, on model outcomes. And, and in fact, on trade-offs, 
between possible policies you might be considering with this model, or it will induce uncertainty about projections of model into the future. And commonly, we undertake what are known as parameter variation experiments to examine the, the impacts of, of our uncertainty, our limited knowledge, our imperfect knowledge, our fallible fallibility, fallible knowledge with respect to parameter values. And this is a so universal a feature of modeling that in many venues, it can be hard to get published without conducting a credible parameter variation experiment. Um, and uh, what I mean by that is showing that, you know, you've made a good faith attempt to examine to what degree your results are contingent upon the particular assumptions you've made about parameter values. If the results of your model are totally different, for different assumptions of values for parameters, um, you know, it, it bears caution. It bears caveats on, in interpreting results of your model. And it, it bears emphasis on collecting more confidence about the value of those parameters or collecting more information about them. It can put a premium on, on gathering more data that might inform the value of those parameters or gathering more, more observations and expert judgment of those parameters. So we're, we're shortly going to be going to, to the issue of, of uh, parameter variation experiments. But um, uh, we'll also be talking about calibration. And here, in as much as we're uncertain about some parameters, we're trying to trying to inform our, our best guesses as to what those parameter values are by arriving at an informed judgment about those parameter values, leveraging what evidence we do have to estimate those parameters. And the key thing about dynamic models, it's quite different from any other sorts of models, sorts of models, quite different from spreadsheet models or risk analysis models as commonly used is the fact that we can leverage data, not just about each parameter in isolation to inform best guesses of those parameters. We can leverage data that reflects emergent patterns from the world, patterns that we observe in the world that, that are not a function of one parameter by itself, but they're a function of the, the broader interacting model and the interaction of many parameter other parameters, but many aspects of model structure. So with calibration, we're leveraging that data. We're turning this data about observed behavior, sort of emergent patterns in the world, and we're, we have the lens, which kind of focuses it down to estimate the value of a particular parameter. And like a lens, it's like a point estimate of that parameter, it tries to give the single best guess for that parameter. Now. This process for agent-based models has a much in common, much in common with calibration for other sorts of models. A, a process that sometimes goes by the name calibration, sometimes automated parameter estimation. Sometimes people just say in shorthand parameter estimation in certain subfields. But uh, across many fields of modeling, discrete event simulation, system dynamics, compartmental modeling, and ABM, we, we find this general idea of, of arriving at an estimate of a parameter value based on observed data. But with agent-based models, with observed emergent data, but based on, um, on, on agent-based models, we have extra texture that we don't have for some common other sorts of models. So ordinary differential equation models. We have issues of stochastic variability. So we're trying to estimate the value of parameters in a context where the model is variable outcome for a given, a given assumption about those parameters. Even if you assume a certain value of those parameters, same value of the parameters. So we run the model several times over, we get different results. And, and somehow in calibration, you know, on a zero in on 
the most possible parameter values for the model for less well-known components of the model parameters. But in the context of this variability in model output, and reflecting that to some degree, some approaches um, have made use of more sophisticated forms of parameter uncertainty, and, and particularly in the last decade, and uh, in a in a contribution to which in an area to which we've contributed on uh, a number of a uh, number of publications. There's this growth of Bayesian methods together with dynamic modeling and it, with agent-based modeling uh, being one of the, the techniques with which they're used. And regardless of whether it's approximate Bayesian or genuinely kind of true, true blue Bayesian approaches, um, many of these share the feature that you have a, a posterior distribution for model parameters that are less well known, and then you seek to sample from a posterior distribution of those parameters. A, a value, you see a sample from plausible values of those parameters as suggested by model structure and empirical data observed. So instead of going for one privileged set of estimates of the parameter values, one, one assignment of values to the parameters on which you hang your hat, you're instead sampling plausible values of parameters from a distribution jointly, jointly. So in other words, we say, well, you know, contact rate could be high and transmission probability could be low. That's one interpretation. Or contact rate could be low and transmission probability could be high. That's another interpretation. And you don't privilege one of them over the other. You recognize, you know, there's, there's many plausible, uh, plausible explanations for what we see. And so here we're sampling from a distribution. We have different possible values, each associated with some posterior probability or probability density. Um, that's the idea of those techniques. They're, they're, they're sampling parameter values given the model structure and observed data, sampling plausible parameter values from it. Now, beyond this, there's some techniques that are more sophisticated yet, to which we've also contributed a lot for agent-based modelings, but particularly beyond. And some of you who have been present in another fields course that I've taught um, just this past winter will, will recognize uh, this whole notion of statistical filtering and particularly particle filtering and particle MCMC. And here, we're estimating not just parameter values, but the state of the model. Um, and, and we're correcting our understanding of that state as more data arrives. Um, and we're correcting what the model's telling us with what empirical data is correcting and living up to that, I think it was the Norwegian manual for the, the, for the Norwegian army, which said, you know, if you're lost, Go use the maps. Um, uh, but if what you see around you doesn't match the map, if what you see around you, the location of the peaks or whatever in the map, believe what you see around you. Um, don't believe the map. Um, and, and it's kind of a similar idea. Models are like maps. And at some point, with Cidisco filtering, the idea is if the data is telling you about an underlying situation in the model you didn't think was very likely, well, give a lot of credence to that data and, and recognize that the model may be off sometimes, or and there are a lot of possibilities for what the model could result in, and you're clued in constantly to the, based on these observations in the world about what's really happening out there, and, and updating our understanding from the modeling to reflect that. Um, so statistical filtering is is uh, an area which lies inside the scope of the course, but it is an important and increasingly prominent feature of the modern sort of canon of the uh, systems data science, bringing together data science and system science. I'm not going to be dwelling on that, but it's a big topic um, that you'll find me speak about um, in other other classes and other venues. 
Beyond that, we have structural uncertainty. We have uncertainty about the structure of the model. You know, you know, we have uncertainty about, you know, is there an asymptomatic category or is there an exposed state or can people lose immunity uh, after having built it? These are practical questions. When I was uh, seconded to the health system and we worked with folks in, um, in our communities in Saskatchewan's North, predominantly Indigenous communities, one of the questions I was asked from an HMO on the ground, um, a medical health officer on the ground was, excuse me, uh, MHO on the ground was, you know, uh, is it possible people are losing, the, uh, losing their immunity? Um, you know, how much would that affect model results uh, in terms of findings of the trade-off between, um, between different uh, possible public health strategies? To what degree do they contingent on that assumption of model structure that once people are infected by COVID-19, they won't get reinfected? And, you know, she was prescient, right? Um, at that time, the literature was fairly sparse, but now it's quite clear. People can get reinfected. Finally, um, uh, depending on how our timing is in the late part of this course, we may or may not get to this issue of dynamic decision making. Um, making decisions that are adapt to ongoing circumstances, to ongoing resolution of uncertainties, where you're not sure what you're, you should do, and what you do depends very much on what you see from the world. And sometimes you wait and see before making a decision. Um, you defer your decision until more data comes in. Or you make a decision now, which offers you flexibility later to make different decisions. You take advantage of what's known in, in quite prominent areas uh, uh, in, in management science as sort of real options. You give yourself the option of flexibility in the future for what to decide. And you, you engage in ongoing adaptive decision-making in the light of unfolding uncertainty. Um, this is another sort of uh, prominent ways in which models come together with uncertainty. So we have a lot of, lot of topics here. Um, and we don't have the luxury of being able to cover all of them. But I do want to talk about several of them in a more substantive way. Um, and today, I'm going to begin with the first, fittingly, um, per Lewis Carroll and Alice in Wonderland. You start at the beginning, and then you go to the end and stop, as he said. Um, uh, so stochastic variability is what we're going to be talking about today. The modest but very significant and far-reaching uh, impact of stochastics within the model dynamic uncertainty, uncertainty over time, and how it induces uncertainty in model outcomes. So a lot of concepts here, a lot of highfalutin ideas. Let's, let's go take a look at a model. Let's go ground ourselves by, by looking at a model, if we could. Um, and to that end, I posted two models for our viewing pleasure here, okay? So, so if you go to the course site um, and you, you go down to the model area, you'll find not merely an upgraded version of this model we've had before. And we're not gonna use the old version. We're gonna use version two. It's, it's been built for you, okay? Um, and uh, I built it just for you and, uh, We'll, we'll download that, version two of multi-clinic SIS hybrid saturation effects in Locken, <clears throat> version two. And then the other one is SIRS crowding disparities, version 13 with stratified projected state space, okay? Um, uh, those, those terms will get more familiar as time goes on, but... Um, uh, we're going to be talking about health disparities and, and, and state space in coming lectures um, and some of the unique features that come in with HMS modeling for both. But for now, I'd like you to download both those. Okay. And we're going to start appropriately enough with the first of them. 
multi-clinic SAS hybrid saturation effects and lock-in conversion too. Okay, so if you can download those and, and load them up, you'll do well, okay? Um, so I'm going to switch, if I may, to that. Now, we're going to reacquaint ourselves with this model. We saw this model not two days then um, from this very floor. So within this model, we have a simple uh, characterization of, of individual uh, state in its evolution. So we have an infection state chart, um, which characterizes, as you as its name suggests, the concerns related to infection. So people are susceptible, exposed, and infected and symptomatic. Note there's no immune state. They go back after being infected and symptomatic to susceptible based on, does anyone remember what did this transition represent in this model? We saw this model last time. What did it represent? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, they were cured. They were cured. Um, it's like they went through, as Jeff McDonald said, a healing beam, and and they were cured in the clinic. Okay. Um, and uh, actually, this one actually had a healthcare worker that deserved them. The, the beam was in another context. Um, so here we have uh, infection uh, state chart. And over here, we have some care of seeking. And this model had a bit of emergent behavior at an individual level in terms of the count of times they were infected and so on, and the count of presentations, which will actually be of significance in, uh, in a few minutes, okay? Um, so each person we record over the course of time, how many times that they've been infected, how many times they've gone around this loop, and how many times they've presented for care, okay? Um, so if someone's, a, as they used to be called sometimes frequent flyers, and I understand now that's, uh, that's, not, that's not the uh, term we're supposed to use. Uh, uh, they're called uh, friendly faces, last I heard. Um, friendly faces are ones that you keep on seeing again, you know, each. Uh, very frequently in the SDI clinic or in the emergency room, et cetera. And, um, and these people are placed in, uh, in, in a context of homes uh, where, where they interact with others and uh, they have networks associated with them. So let's go, let's go run that if we could. Um, and we'll, we'll remind ourselves of the sort of spatial context here um, and the facts uh, that we start with a certain number of people exposed, hence the yellow, um, in homes, and they are interacting with others nearby. Um, so, so here they are sending messages um, to, excuse me, um, to randomly connected people. Um, and we're not actually showing the network uh, here. We, we, we could do that, um, but it might be a little bit, um, little bit of an eyesore. And over time, um, there's going to be a spread of infection here, okay? Um, and uh, these people are going to uh, uh, present for care. Uh, to seek care, but they've spread it to others in the meantime. And there's kind of this whack-a-mole which occurs early on. People are seeking care up at this clinic uh, and, and being treated, but if they wait too long, they'll leave. So we saw all this last time and I won't belabor the point. Um, and there's a network uh, induced on here, which we could go view and, and I'm tempted to Temp fade and 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 uh, try to try to show it just to make it more clear that there's this network in the background. So infection spread, people getting cured. Now, what I want to ask you, and what I'd like you to ponder right now, is um, is uh, where is their stochastics in this model? Where is their randomness in the model? So there's a a network in all its fulsome, fulsome glory. Um, that's why I didn't show it. Okay, 
Um, so where is there uncertain? So where is there stochastics? Well, maybe I'll just ask first. Where is there, where is there uncertainty in this model more broadly? Where is there chance in this model? Can anyone? So, when when disease spread? Yeah. Good. Okay. Yeah. So. So this infective person sends to, you could just see it there, random connected. They send to someone in their network. And it could make a difference if they send it to someone who's already infected or exposed, or they're already infected. It won't make a bit of difference to them, right? Um, a stone that fall, a, a, a seed that falls on stony ground. Uh, by contrast, if it if they send this message to someone who's susceptible, they they could get them infected right there. That's this whole message transition. Um, so if, if they're susceptible, that person's going to be exposed. So that's an aspect of chance. Where else is there an aspect of chance? Anyone see? Is it, there's actually another one in this diagram um, that's also associated with the rate transition, a certain chance per unit time of going. Where, where is that? Can anyone say? I'm going to try to in chat exposures. Yes, initial initial infection. I love it. I love it. Benjamin said initial infection, and Benjamin uh, and Wade are both exactly right. So if we go back to Maine, we double click on Maine, and uh, we go down Maine. Um, what we're going to see here is that. And uh, I'm looking in a certain place here, but um, uh, I was expecting to find, um, okay, so, uh, right. Um, there should have been a certain fraction of people and often we get it through sending the messages, but this model, as I look at it, I see a certain fraction start infective, and it's random who starts infected. At the start, some people start infected, All right? Um, uh, how about anyone else? Um, where, where else is there a bit of uncertainty over time here? Well, this one right here, right? When they seek care. Um, and if they don't seek care quickly, they might infect more people in the meantime, right? Um, so that's a chance of that. But there's more too. I mean, there's another chance factor in the model is where people are located. If we go up to Maine, we go down Maine, and we go look at per uh, at at person, they're placed in random homes. And where or where are the homes located? Well, let's go see. The homes are distributed. Um, at uh at random places, and you you can't see that directly, but if we go to Maine and we go down, we'll sign, find the layout type of random. So people are, are associated with random homes and homes are located at random places and that will dictate what clinic they go to and who else they contact and who's nearby and their network. So there's a lot of different aspects of uncertainty in this model. And in fact, if we run this model several times over, um, I'll, I'll go to the baseline. You could see right now it's run with a, a fixed seed. This is referring to a thing called a random number seed, sort of the starting point of the random sequence. Models, um, so computers are routinely asked, regardless of whether it's dynamic modeling for other purposes in Excel, for example, to generate random numbers. And this is a routine thing we do in, 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 in modeling, and it's a routine thing we do elsewhere. And to start that sequence off, you need what's called a seed. It's, it's like you, you start out, you plant the seed, and everything else follows from it. Um, and if you start with a fixed seed, you'll get the same sequence out. Your computer isn't listening to decay of radioactive materials or something. It's, it's instead generating something that looks for all the world like a random sequence. Well, I'm exaggerating. It looks a lot like a random sequence by 
you know, by sort of naive expo uh, uh, exploration. But it's totally deterministic. It depends on the seed, and then it will use a certain algorithm to generate numbers that appear statistically independent. Um, uh, and there's all science of generating numbers more effectively. This uses the, the Java random number generator, which you know you could go look up, but it's a very widely used one. And um, it's generally you know has a pretty decent random number generator. Um, you can do better uh, if you're really serious about it, but it's unlikely to affect most things in models. This is using a fixed seed. What this means is if we run this model again and again and again, we'll see the, exactly the same results, in fact. Um, but if we used a random seed, each time we run it, we'll see different things. So, so you know, maybe I'll run it with a fixed seed. I'll, I'll start this up and, and we'll loose the hounds. And I just want to, I want you to observe, I want you to remember where this clinic is. We're just going to look at the location of the clinic. It's kind of a, I, 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 you know, if, if that's in the same location every time, it raises confidence that it's, it's not random. It's not totally different random sequences every time. So there's the clinic ensconced between these three points. Okay. Um, now let's, um, and, and notice these three here are infected uh, early on. Now let's go run it again. And what we'll see is with that fixed seed, with that fixed number, we'll see, in fact, what looks like the exact same configuration. There it is. Looks like what we just ran. And if we do it thrice, a third time, we will find the same old pattern. It's like Groundhog Day, right? Um, it's the same old, same old. And that has a lot to recommend it for reproducibility of the model. It's in your interest to be able to reproduce your results. And often you do want to control the seeds so you can go back and reproduce results from the same version of the model, same assumptions, you want the same results. And as a good modeling practice, recording the random number seed you're using is, is a good one. We have tools that, like with any logic, have recorded it automatically uh, for if you if you add them in to the model. So this is a fixed seed. There's no randomness. Now let's oh, sorry, there's no the random number sequence is the same that yields all of these. It's it's being used for the location of all these people, all these homes, this clinic, and um and you know sorting of people into homes and and um which people start in fact and start exposed, et cetera. Uh-huh. Uh -huh. yeah. yeah. Well, right now it's totally fixed. In other words, if we run it, it's well, it, it starts with a fixed seed of one, and you'll get you'll get these replicated results. If we started with a fixed seed of zero, where would you start with a fixed seed of zero or a fixed seed of you know 321 or whatever? Um, we will get different results. So now I'm starting with a fixed seed of zero. It's gonna generate for the each successive roll of the dice, so to speak, it's going to have different things. And lo and behold, this location is different. And the starting people that are infected are located in different places. So with different random number seeds, you're going to get out different results. But if you use the same number seed, if we were to change this back to one, you'll get precisely the same, same result. Well, yeah, it's it's actually used. The, this random number seed is used for all randomness in the model. It's coming from this seed. It grows into a magnificent tree. And it that tree has many branches, and some affect this, and some affect the location of these. Every every random decision will be using that seed. And by the way, there's much more sophisticated things you can do yet and set your own 
random number generator and on the scene, and, you know, it takes work. But but um, the basic picture here is sometimes you want replicable results and you use a mechanism known as setting the seed of the random number generator to a defined known value to get the resulting sequence precisely deterministically set. Okay, even though the model is using randomness, it's using the same sequence of randomness. Um, it it's, says draw from the distribution, but it's gonna draw, if you, if you are using the same sequence each time, it's just like Groundhog Day, it's gonna draw the, the same thing at the same time, okay? Now we're going to, and, and we saw it, we changed the seed value to be different. But now let's go to random seed. Here it will use a different seed every time. It'll pick the seed randomly. Um, okay, I won't, I won't get into that, um, but it may depend on the vagaries of the time of day and you know um, uh, some, some details involving the current, um, current computer clock or what have you. And it'll be a different sequence um, each time. So it's like a different seed each time. So I'm gonna run this. And now we see, okay, the clinic's over here and the infected people starting and infected are kind of up here. Um, it's different, right? And if we run it again, well, we'll see a different configuration, right? Um, uh, because each time we have a different seed and therefore a different sequence of things being produced for the location of this or the location of that or which person goes with which home and, and, and where the homes are located and where the clinic's located and who starts infective, et cetera. It'll be different um, each time. So here it's different each time and you can be excused. In fact, you could be encouraged, excused for or encouraged for asking, you know, um, doesn't this mean all of the results, the rest of the results will be very different uh, of this model? Because based on this, there'll be a different sequence of who gets infected next and, you know, who's, um, um, uh, you know, how many people are at the clinic at any one time, the sort of, um, Crenulations of this graph, the ups and downs and twists and turns, the nooks and crannies of it will be different depending on the random number of seed. And I'm not going to belabor the point by going and trying to study them, but you'll find if you run it with for each time now, which we're using different random seeds, different twists and turns of this. It looks a little bit different, but you will find some regularities. Does anyone remember what happened last time? when I ran this long enough with just this one clinic, what happened eventually? Does anyone remember? Yeah, so with one clinic, Nona notes that it it, it rose up, um, uh, the, the, the utilization, but also the number infected. And then, so, oh, and there it went, right? But look, if you, if you were to run this thing again and again, you might find the exact timing of this a little bit different. Maybe sometimes it would occur, you know, a little bit earlier, sometimes later, by the way, you can go and export it and find, you know, when the midpoint of this was by pasting it into Excel or what have you. But um, the exact timing will be different. You know, these little nooks and crannies here. Um, but look, it, it went, maybe it's at about 5,500. If we were to go run it again, uh, we would find, you know, quite different little, you know, uh, uh, little um, crenulations of that of that graph. Little twists and turns of the graph would be different for exactly when people are getting infected. But the broad regularities, ladies and gentlemen, are still going to be there. And so I'm going to run it here and. Um, you may notice here it's lower at first. Um, and then you may notice, oh my gosh, it disappeared. Do you see that? You see that? It disappeared entirely. It went extinct. Ladies and gentlemen, this time it went extinct. And if you were to run it again, 
you might find it goes extinct or you might find it takes off. Um, but the exact timing of that takeoff, the exact numbers that are that are infected both before and after will be different in their precise values. Um, so here we're getting different sequences in the particulars. Um, and we're getting different possible broad outcomes um, in terms of the infection dying out in the population, in terms of the, you know, the number of people, um, uh, you know, exactly when this big takeoff occurs, right? Um, uh, these are going to be, be different and they're gonna have consequences. So here we're having it still kind of peer around um, but we're anticipating maybe at some point, and maybe you see it coming, uh, it looked like it was taking off there, but it didn't quite do it, right? Um, and at some point, it may go extinct still, because the numbers are small, or it's possible that it will, you know, take off to very, very high values soon. But it may take some more time before that. So last time it occurred about 5,500 it took out, right? Um, but here it's holding out for longer, right? Um, the exact timing may be different. And look at that, it went extinct after about 7,000 days. Um, variability, variability. You will find different particular outcomes. Um, and you know the exact timing, this one took off uh, around 7,000 or so, it took off. Right, ladies and gentlemen, there's, there's variability in outcomes, but there's also some regularities. Broadly speaking, it either tends to kind of peter around and then go extinct, or it tends to go for a while and then take off. But the exact timing of when it takes off, the exact timing of when it dies out is different for each of these. When I have this random seed under randomness. So what are we to do? What is to be done? You know, um, uh, if we have such differences in model outcomes for the same model, the same structure, the same parameter values, the same assumptions with which we run the model in terms of numeric parameter values, we get such variable results. Well, you know, what we want to find here is not the one defined unique outcome. That would be a fool's errand. There isn't one defined unique outcome. But there are certain classes of outcomes that have broad regularities, you know, those that where it takes off to really high levels and the health system is overwhelmed and the clinics are full and a huge fraction of the population is, is, has SDIs and, and they're just constantly spreading and they can't keep up with it and people leave without being seen overwhelming for the clinic and they circulate for a long time or a situation where, you know, by luck and circumstance and hard work of the healthcare workers, they keep it under control for a while, keep up with it, and then it dies out by chance. Those are two broad outcomes. And the vagary, there's vagaries of exactly when does it take off or exactly when does it die? But basically those are the two big ones. So how to arrive at generalizable outcomes, how to recognize these broad regularities from the model? Well, we'll make use ladies and gentlemen, we'll make use of what we, well, the, the basic approach we are just pursuing, which is to run the model many times and observe outcomes for those times. And to that end, not, not uh, an hour and a half then, I, I created some, some experiments to allow you to look at this. So I'd like you to go down to stochastic sensitivity, the final, the final experiment here, the final scenario. And 
maybe the term experiment is better here because this is going to be running the model not once, not twice, but many, many times. In fact, a hundred times. So if you go click on this, see it go over to properties, find a hundred runs. Okay. It's going to run the model 100 times with these parameters that are shown here beneath it. Okay. And it's going to run the model as a with unique simulation models, as Bethan said. And, and it's going to summarize the results in these very graphs here. So we're going to engage in this. Um, and let's, let's go see the results. So we're going to run this. Here we go. And I'm going to click it. And you'll notice that there's this little funny graph down here it's showing my computer the different so called cores of my computer, processing units running in parallel, all, all trying to run this model with different random number seeds. Okay. And it's running at 100 times. You can see the bar at the bottom. It's not running one model over time. No, no, no. It's running all these different models simultaneously and summarizing the results of them for the kind of snapshot of summarizing the model at its at its end. Okay. Um, so what we see, for example, by the end of the model, the average presentation count for the model, the average numbers of times that people have gone to the clinic is four and a half, but some people have gone a hundred times. Frequent flyers, friendly faces. Okay, um, they may not look so friendly after a hundred visits where they have to wait for, you know, three days each time or something, but, um, but they're faces anyway. Um, up here, we see average illness counts. Some people have been infected 15 times uh, by illness, some more, um, presumably if they're going to the clinic, a uh, hundred Oh, this is illness count. This is the number of times they've been affected. They may go for a given bout of chlamydia. They may go many times and say, oh man, it's still full. I'm, I'm out of here. <laughs> and then they come back a few days later, you know, maybe it's, maybe I can get in at the head of the line today. Oh man, it's, it's way too busy. So they leave again. So a hundred times, maybe the same 15 illnesses, just again, again, again. But most people had, you know, the single, uh, uh, well, I guess this, this is probably an average here. It, it could be a median, I have to check. I think it's the average, um, uh, is, is two. They've gotten infected twice, probably because they've never gotten over, you know, one of them, um, the latter one. The average clinic utilization, interestingly, in the model is 0.08 by the, the end time of the model. And what that suggests is that a lot of the times the infection died out at some point. And, and therefore, you know, a small number of times it was super heavily utilized, but a lot of the times by the time the end of the model came along, basically no one was needing to go to the clinic, the dream of public health, right? But this is uh, highly variable, right? And, and some have an average of like 0.5 or 0.6, et cetera. So what we're doing here is we're running what's called an ensemble of runs, a whole collection of runs, a whole collection of what we call realizations, each associated with a different random number sequence, each with different happenstance, different vagaries of the situation and summarizing the results over the model. And what we see is a portrait in heterogeneous results, a variability in results. Mm -hmm. um, so we get a portrait of you know, behavior at the end of the, the model, but let's go, if we may, let's go look at variability over time in the model, if we could. So, I'm going to stop this model, and uh, we're going to repair to the other model, SIRS crowding disparities version 13 with stratified projected state space. That's also there for you to to download. Okay, um, 
And if you haven't downloaded that, uh, you can do it. But here we're going to have uh, also some uh, some simulation uh, outcomes, okay? And um, the first of them, well, first let's let's acquaint ourselves with this model. So this is a familiar simple structure, SIRS, because there's people lose immunity after a certain period of time. Um, people are placed in networks, and the networks are uh, connect a person with other nearby people here. Um, uh, they're connected with people within a range of 75, and they are placed um, at, at locations that are, that are random um, uh, in space. So um, yeah, I think the user defined basically uh, treats it as, as, as well. Okay, hold on for a second. And if we go look at the population here, they're placed on actually uniform Y, but uh, their income is used to set their X level. And this is one where we have some people with very low income and some people with, with higher. Income. Yeah. Um, so let's, if we go look and, and we go to simulation here, we're gonna have a population size of 100. I'm going to run this model. Uh, and what we'll see is a network um, where people to the left, lower income people, are more tightly connected than these well healed individuals to the right. And as a result, here you don't actually get propagation of infection over here to the right, right? These folks can isolate away from the matting crowd. If we go to simulation, and I'm gonna change it to 250 population, let's say, what we'll see is more connectivity uh, being induced in that network, emerging from the connections. And yet there's still infected people over here uh, to the left who are transmitting it, links themselves, and uh, that poses a risk of, of catching in these networks further to the right where people have higher incomes, okay? Um, so um, model of infection spread over networks, people's um, uh, income determines where they are at X, but they are random Y, and they're connected with nearby people. So here too, there's randomness. Can anyone say what's one aspect of randomness we, of which I spoke? What's an aspect of randomness? Uh, okay, yeah. And so I'm gonna sharpen things by distinguishing two types of randomness. And this is an important distinction conceptually in modeling. We, we talk about randomness over time using the word stochastics. That means there's uncertainty over time. Um, it's like over time you're rolling dice. And we have instances of that. And then we have some that's just uncertainty at the initial state. Or, you know, and for other models might be picking parameter values or arranging the network uh, initially. What things would be an aspect of uncertainty and an initial state here. Can anyone say? Income. Sorry? Income. Uh, yeah, their income is actually good. Good call. Good call. Yeah, their income is actually drawn from here. If we got a population, their income is drawn from a log normal distribution. Okay. Um, uh, so, so we have a, a log normal distribution that sets their income, and then their income dictates their x location. What's another aspect of their initial situation that's uh, random here? We don't use the term stochastic, but random. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, the initial location, so, so their Y location. And that dictates who else they're connected to, to whom, to whom they are connected. Okay? So there's some aspects of their initial situation, their income, their Y location, and therefore their network connections that are aspects that are random, but they're not stochastic. They're not varying over time. There are some aspects here that are stochastic. Can anyone cite one? 
By the way, who's uh, infected initially is also random. I wouldn't call it stochastic because it's at the initial state, it's at the initial time. It's not random, it's over time. It's not over time, it's just one time. What, what, what aspect is stochastic here? Can anyone say? Okay, when they contact others, so that's true. Their contact, well, the creation of the network is at the initial time, though. So I would say that's an aspect of not stochastics, it's a, a random. There's uncertainty associated with it, but it's just at the initial time. I'm, I'm talking in terms of stochastics. This contact rate is stochastic, it occurs at a certain rate. Exactly how many people they infect before they recover is random. Who they infect when or who they send messages to when is, is stochastic. Is stochastic. Um, how many times they expose people and the timing of that and, and the to whom uh, in particular they expose. These are all stochastic. See, ran, send to random connected. Also the timing of their loss of immunity is stochastic. So there's aspects of stochastics in this model and, and initial situation. By the way, sometimes this is stochastic, yeah? It's occurring over the chance, this is a hazard, rate. Right? It's a chance for a unit time that they will recover. And it's like each day or each microsecond or each femtosecond or picosecond, they, have a certain probability of 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 uh, losing um, their immunity and going back to a susceptible state. So if someone's here for each a little bit of time, you know they they have this chance of losing uh, their immunity. Um, and the exact timing of when they lose their immunity is stochastic. Yeah, the occurrence of it is stochastic. So this is a model that that has uncertainty and stochastic. In some models, we actually will. We'll actually use one random number seed for the initial state, set it up. So every time it's set up maybe exactly the same way, but then we'll only vary the stochastics over time. Some people do that. I I think often it's it's not that insightful, but but some people get rather uh, excited about that and I'm fine with it. Um, but uh, one way or the other, if we run this model several times, we'll see with with random number seeds so i went to simulation i said random seed we'll see different results and i'm not going to belabor this as much as i did the last one but you will see uh different outcomes induced here with this population of 250 different exact timings for you know the uh, when uh when infection goes up or down the exact timing of this peak will differ. The, the exact shape of this state space phase portrait, which we'll be talking about sometime, um, and will differ. And so if I run it several times, there'll be, you know, different vagaries also of who starts infected and who gets infected secondly and thirdly and all those sort of things will be different for each one. Um, fair enough. Um, and uh, you could see this way it had um, less less twistiness back here, I think, et cetera. In any case, there's differences run to run. And so we run an ensemble of realizations. So let's go to Monte Carlo baseline. So here, we're gonna run the model with these fixed assumptions a thousand times. I'm gonna say a hundred times, just to keep the, the number down and let us make some some progress here in class. Okay, 100 times. 100 times we're gonna run this model. And each time we're gonna note the incident case count over time. Now you can't see this very well. Um, and I apologize for that, but there's, it, it's kind of like the view from up here in Canada looking south. There's kind of a, a vague orange glow um, down there, which is disconcerting, perhaps. Um, uh, but you'll notice actually there's two um, there's two peaks here. This is bimodal. What I mean by that is that if we 
if we, this is a, what's called a 2D histogram that's being shown. Most of you are familiar with histograms. That's what we saw from that other model, right? where they summarize, you know, what fraction of people have between uh, zero and two infections over the course of the model. What number added between two and four? What number added between four and six? What number added between four and eight? You know, or what fraction of the population? That would be a histogram, right? It sort of suggests an empirical distribution of outcomes. This is a 2D histogram. 2D. So over at a given time, there's a histogram. So for each little interval of time, each little kind of, uh, maybe it's two time units or something, um, we will do a histogram as to how many people are, have, have been recently infected uh, at that time. I think this is, this is an incident case common. I should double check it. Uh, based on the numbers, um, yeah, maybe it is. Uh, I, I suspect it's a public case. Code. In any case, um, we have a histogram for that time. So, in other words, um, how many people were infected at the time? If we sliced it here, we were to slice it at time three hundred. We we find that there's kind of a larger number of people. This is the kind of faint, menacing orange glow here. Um, uh, and and then it's low for a long time, and then it's high again down here. What are these? What does this glow down here suggest? Can anyone say? The fact that this that this is um, uh, kind of glowing and orange down at the bottom here. What is that suggesting? Yeah, there's quite a few runs where there's nobody infected. Uh, that's right, or nobody recently infected here. And then, then there's a, a large number of runs where we have different numbers of people, like between basically 60 and 80. I'm having trouble seeing this, unfortunately. And six, something like, or 60 and 100, maybe. In any case, somewhere up here. So it's almost like two mountains, right? There's a mountain down here at the bottom. Kind of, you, if you slice it and kind of look at it from the side, it's kind of like there's a mountain down here sticks up and then I would think about viewing a histogram from the side. It's like if I slice it, I see a histogram and it's kind of high here and then it down and then it goes up here and then down again. Um, that gives a slice of this gives a, a histogram, familiar histogram as to how many people are recently infected or currently infected there. And I, again, I, I need to double check it since in the case of mine. Suspicious, but in any case, um, the um, this is a two D histogram, and it summarizes variability over time. Right? And you'll notice all runs basically start, all realizations start with very few people being infected at the start, right? Um, and then they take some take off and some die out here, right? Like at any one time, there's significant chance that you have. Essentially, no one uh, infected anyone. Um, so this is capturing some variability. But if we go copy this, um, go copy it here, and if you were to go call up uh, Google, you know, Google Sheets or something, um, uh, or Excel, or your, you know, um, open a LibreOffice. Um, and you, you could paste it in and you'll see these are units of time between zero and two time, uh, time zero and two and two and four and four and six, et cetera. And this is the number of people um, currently, the incident case count at that time, according to this. And, um, and then uh, this is giving the fraction of the population uh, who um, have this incident case count um, between here? So, so uh, it's very interesting that this uh, some of these are are, are so so high uh, with such uniform probability. Um, but you could see broadly, it's sort of. Um, in fact, I'm going to have to uh, look at this more. This, this looks to me a little bit curious that first column. But you can kind of see you tend to get 
more people um, uh, infected here, and it sort of tends to take off between sort of time 34 and 40, um, with some being up in the many hundreds by time 50. So um, this is a result of 100 runs. If we were to instead go look at 1,000 runs, you would see more regularity yet, and I'll, I'll just run that. So the stochastic variability would be summarized with respect to more samples. There we had only 100 samples. And not surprisingly, there were lots of places where no runs had, had tread. I'm going to run this with 1,000. Sorry, that, say that again. Oh, okay. Um, oh, the axes are reversed. Okay, that would be interesting. So in other words, it may be the time was going down and number of people infected was going in. That would, um, that would make that would make sense. Yes, that would that would make sense of that first column, because basically it's saying for you know overall time there's some small chance, small but non-trivial chance, like 0.15 for later times that uh, there's nobody infected. Actually, um, so thank you, Wade. Um, uh, that's that's awesome. Um, and uh, so this is, wait a saying, this is actually time here. This is incident case count uh, along the x-axis. Um, and, uh, and here, uh, what this is saying is, you know, for later periods of time, it's like 13.4% of runs, you know, at time 224 had between zero and two people infected. Um, and similarly, 4, 476. Um, but at the start, all runs had had between zero and two people infected, right? Um, and as you, you could see over time, you know, there's, um, as time goes up um, uh, here to time 100, for example, you get more and more people, uh, you, you know, uh, developing. Uh, there's a large numbers of runs where there's, larger numbers of people infected or, or recently infected, you know, 46, 48, uh, 50, et cetera. And you could see having run it for a hundred realizations, a hundred times over the simulation model, we see a lot, a lot more statistical reliability in the results. So less, less holes of zero. There's still some through stochastic variability in small numbers, but there's fewer. Okay, so, so we've gotten a, a taste of, some of the impacts of stochastic variability, ladies and gentlemen, and model outcomes. Um, I'm going to zoom out, and we're going to go back to the salt mines. We're going to go back to the slides, okay? Um, and in particular, I'm, I'm going to be looking at these slides on stochastic processes in these in these models. Um, and you know, it's very common for for simulation models to include a characterization of some important processes from the world in a stochastic way. This is kind of, in a way, it's, it's in between not representing them at all um, and representing them um, uh, in a, a, a pre-specified way, um, uh, or arguably, excuse me, between pre-specified way and, and representing them endogenously. So there's stochastics here that are that are induced, but you know th they're abstracting away from the details, the vagaries of exactly what's driving the stochastics. The idea is, look, there's many things. If we look at it close up, um, it'll be exhaustively um, um, demanding to try to characterize the exact drivers for the precise timing when someone seeks care for an STI, for example, or the exact timing of 
of, of when they're going to expose someone with a car nearby or when they're going to, you know, who exactly they're transmitting to. We don't want to deal with, you know, who accompanies who for what reason. I mean, a model that way would just be a needlessly, um, needlessly involved, right? Um, so instead, we characterize a lot of things that are sort of outside the scope of the model, outside um, uh, what we find natural to characterize, what we need to characterize for the scope of the model. We characterize them stochastically. And, you know, there's very good reason for this. You could quibble maybe about whether, you know, how much detail we want to put in about care seeking, and maybe we do want to take into account when the clinic's open or take into account people's working schedules, and there's some case there. But, you know, often, um, if you really think about it, it's clear there's a lot of things you don't want to get into modeling. So if you have a model which you know, has rainfall in it. You don't want to turn into a weather model, right? You know, and 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 sort of characterize weather patterns. Um, but maybe you want to characterize variability in rainfall as it affects the mosquito populations, which then transmit West Nile virus. Um, or oil prices, or economic growth, or stock market. There's a lot of a lot of factors, and in general aspects of decision making. Um, at a certain point, you might want to characterize stochastically or, you know, aspects of a person's toing and throwing and going back and forth. Um, so what's considered stochastic will depend on the scope of the model, right? I mean, um, um, if you're interested in capturing aspects of preferences of, for um, care-seeking and you want to ask questions about when should a clinic be open, Maybe your model does actually have some more detailed representation of decision making about whether to go to a clinic at different times, et cetera. Maybe, maybe it has something to do with how busy the clinic is, or maybe it has something to do with, you know, um, the convenience vis-a-vis -vis work or or uh, availability of amenities there and you know, childcare there or what have you. And so a more detailed model you might characterize things, preferences, aspects of that. And, and a less detailed model, you'll just treat as stochastic when they know. Um, so just be aware, that the issue of what is stochastic will depend on model scope, right? Um, now, ABM and discrete event models um, are typically stochastic. Um, commonly, we'll have transitions between states, event firing, messages being sent, duration of a procedure, for example, in a discrete event simulation model, model of sort of flow and healthcare processes, for example, workflow will be stochastic. And, and as a result of that, there'll be variability from simulation to simulation. This is not universally true. Um, we have looked at some models where it's totally deterministic. It's an agent-based model, but totally deterministic. Can anyone think of an agent-based model we ran, which had no stochastic variability? So its initial state was maybe random, but it had no variability over time. After that, it was entirely dictated by the rules. Anyone think? Game of life. Game of life. Yeah, the game of life. And you could argue um, there's there's versions of the prisoner's dilemma where we put people into a 2D grid, we scatter different um, different uh, you, know, uh, you know strategies around, and they're interacting with each other. And, but we would need some way, some deterministic way of the, of, of dictating, say, when a cell is colonized and by which neighbor. So maybe you give it to the neighbor who, who uh, has the highest energy or something like that. And then it'll be totally deterministic. So there are, there are models that are agent-based models that are totally deterministic, but typically because they focus at such a small level, at uh, such a fine-grained level, the level of particular events, we, we actually do have stochastics. And, um, and we use them rather liberally compared to, say, system dynamics compartmental model. Um, 
And as a result, we, we need to run an ensemble of realizations, right? We, we're gonna run the model again and again and again. And what we've seen is it's not just that last model should have alerted us to the fact that it's not just, you know, variability about some mean. Um, there's uh, overall time, there's some chance that ex except for this very first, um, uh, th this, this little bit of, of time, there's some chance that we'll have zero people infected. And then there's some significant chance, well, lots of people infected out, out here. Um, so, you know, there's some variability in, in results. Um, and at the same time, uh, there's, there's broad regularities between them. You know, you might say, okay, there's 13 or so percent of runs that, that just peter out. They have no, no long-term big outbreak that results. And then maybe there's, you know, the balance of those, the 87.6% or whatever it is, um, 80, 86.6% uh, um, uh, that are, um, that are actually yield a, a big, um, a big outcome. Um, uh, and here, statistics will be very valuable. And we're going to talk about this some next time. But a particular value within this area is a set of non-parametric tests. Um, because you're, you're dealing with variability from the model. But you're dealing with a world where, as my colleague Ross Hammond commented once, and summarizing my thinking precisely at the time, that when we observe the world, we only observe one realization. <laughs> We're not, we don't have an ensemble of realizations from the world um, about what happens over time. We, we, of course, have observations from different days, but uh, we don't have the luxury of having different time series, you know, 100 different time series samples from the world. So often we have, you know, observation from the world. We have to compare it with observation from the model, which is really an ensemble of realizations. And we want to ask how plausible is this observation from the world, for example, in light of what we see from the model? Maybe it falls neatly into the high probability density part of model outcomes. In other words, maybe it's very much in line with the variability we see from the model. It falls within that distribution, um, in which case we might say it's, it's very plausible. Um, so, you know, here we've been making use of these Mont so-called Monte Carlo methods, where we roll dice again and again and again, just like in the Monte Carlo Casino in Monaco, um, uh, drawing samples from distributions. Um, uh, and uh, and you know observing uh, those results um, uh, and you know it induces variability uh, in in results. Um, uh, now um, you know commonly from this we end up recording the outcomes in these things called two D histograms, um, and as we've seen, it divides up time into some number of intervals um, on, the, on the time axis and on the, um, the y axis. And we count, for example, the number that, that fall into each bin or the fraction of runs that fall into each bin. So for example, um, you know, again, 13.4% of all runs between time 140 and 147, um, had between zero and two people infected, but then, you know, 0 0.02, um, 0 0.002, um, uh, fraction had between 38 and 40 infected. And if we if we look out here, we'd find, for example, um, a full 49%, um, oh, sorry, 4.9%, excuse me, um, you know, have between 74 and 76 uh, people infected. Um, so uh, here, you know, we have these, these, uh, uh, these uh, 2D histograms to summarize the results. Um, 
Okay. Um, right. Um, now, what we've been showing in this is one way of looking at outcomes, um, and and it's showing histograms and and so-called bins. Uh, this is associated with the the histogram plot. Some other times we want to show envelopes, and and these may be envelopes, for example, around the um, the median. Um, uh, and here they're associated with quantiles or fractiles. Um, so um, and we're looking at, at sort of uh, quantiles within the results. So 0.25 means the boundary between the lowest and the second lowest quantile. And and uh, my recollection is they're, they're driven in any logic in particular on the mean. Um, so you're finding around the mean, uh, sorry, the median, excuse me, um, median again, the value such that 50% of values are above it, 50% are above. Um, and uh, in these, these envelopes uh, summarize that. So we'll go up, up here and we'll go back to uh, any logic here. And what I'm going to do is go to this 2D histogram within this Monte Carlo baseline. And I'm gonna say show envelopes here, okay? And we will go look at the envelopes, um, sort of successive levels here uh, around this um, around this median. So I'm going to let this run out, but you'll note that what this is saying is at time 100, for example, around the median, um, uh, and you could go look, I think this might be 25% of all runs laid in this value, in this area, 50% in this one, 75% within this run. You'll notice that it's it's kind of um, frenetically sometimes going up, it was sometimes going down. What is it saying that this is reaching the bottom here? Can anyone say? What does it say that that envelope reaches the very bottom? What does that mean? Can anyone interpret that? The fact that this envelope goes all the way down here to the bottom. What does that say? Well, okay, maybe, maybe I'll ask a more basic question. I wanna make sure you're on the same page with me. What roughly is the value of the median? Sorry? Yeah. Okay, it's a bimodal distribution. That, that's correct. We'll, we'll come to that. I'm, I wanna make sure though other people are, are, are on the same page. So with this distribution here, what's the median roughly? Roughly what's the rough value of the median? I just wanna make sure you're cluing into this. What's the rough value of the median of this distribution? Yeah, about 80, about 80, right? yeah. uh, more or less, uh, slightly less. I think. Okay, um, that's right. Well, it's not constant initially, right? But it, it reaches an equilibrium. This is, this is a model where um, uh, people are, losing immunity of, over time. And so it doesn't just run its course and die out. It, it um, continues to circulate. Uh, accumulated in the 80, I'm not, I mean, this is showing over time, what's the distribution of the, this is again, incident case count, but, at that time, right? So this is, if you cut it, this is a, an envelope. This is a, a, a sort of like, it's, this is not quite a histogram, but it's showing the envelopes around that at that time. So the median here happens to be a bit below 80. It still happens to be a bit below 80 here because it's gone to a stochastic equilibrium where it's sort of, it's an endemic equilibrium. But wage point is exactly right. The fact that this outer envelope reaches down to the bottom here is an indication 
it suggests that there are some that are way down here. And in fact, it is bimodal. You don't see it brought out in this envelope because it, like we did with bins, we saw there's actually a peak down here. This is showing envelopes around the median. And you'll notice it's also asymmetric, right? I mean, um, it could be a lot lower than 80, but it's not a ton higher, right? It could be as high as roughly 100 in this period, but it's no higher than that. But it could be as low as zero down here. Um, so these are envelopes, and these are also you know, often used uh, for summary. You'll notice early on, there's much greater variability, um, and there's much more confidence. The median went way up to like 200 here and then came down, okay? So there's a way of summarizing the results here, okay? Um, so let's go, um, uh, right, um, okay. Um, yeah, I think uh, I could offer more comments on some of the stochastics, but I think I'm going to, uh, excuse me, some of the um, statistics involved, but I think we'll we'll cover that more next time. Um, so uh, I think we'll uh, sort of work to, to wrap up right now. I mean, what have, what have we seen? Well, we started talking about this interface between models and uncertainty. There's, there's many aspects of this interface. Um, and one of them uh, is the fact that when we have stochastic, when we have agent-based models, they are almost invariably, or, you know, the large preponderance are stochastic. And because of that, there are there is variability in the results running the model, the same set of parameters will yield different results for different runs. And yet there are very there are broad regularities. We saw that in the last you know um, uh, outcome there with those envelopes around the medium. So a lot of regularities there. There's a lot of orderliness to it. There's a lot of patterns there over time. And if we look at enough runs, we'll see. Gosh, you know, there's all these conserved properties, all these properties that are that are broadly held in common, but there's variability. Some have, and some it dies out, and some it lasts for a long period of time and tends to have a median, reasonably, reasonably tight median, you know, up around uh, somewhere just short of 80. Um, people nearly infected per, per seven, a uh, seven day window, weekly window. Um, so, um, you know, uh, it's not like the results of the model with the stochastics are just totally all over the place. It's just willy nilly. There's no pattern to it. No, 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 no. There's a lot of regularities. There. Structural regularities in the model induce regularities in the generated patterns, the emergent patterns. And one of the key tools in our toolbox for recognizing those patterns, reasoning about them, in being and and formulating conclusions that are robust in light of this variability is it consists of running the model many times over. And as we'll see next time, you know, a key component of that is reasoning about the statistical properties of the results when we try to compare model results from a whole ensemble possibilities that are all possible outcomes of the model, given our assumptions against real world data, which, you know, is observations from one realization on the world. And we'll see that, you know, statistics form, and particularly non-parametric statistics, form a particularly key ally in comparing the two. And so we'll talk next time about some of the roles that statistics play. And why with agent-based models, we have a, a very um, a very productive, fruitful, and um, powerful um, uh, sort of synergistic relationship between statistics on the one hand and agent-based modeling on the other. Um, uh, with, with compartmental modeling, um, there's quite a few compartmental modelers 
who don't really um, heavily, heavily make use of stochastics, or excuse me, of statistics, but with stochastics and nature-based models, um, you know, you're you're very frequently called upon to to reason statistically about the results and reason statistically about the consistency of your results with what we see from the world. Um, so, so next time we'll talk about that and we'll start talking about the impacts of parameter variability. Here, we are keeping the parameters the same. Next time, we're gonna be asking about outcomes for the model if we vary parameters, either in some very well-defined way, like in a grid, where we successfully implement one, change one parameter, another parameter, another parameter, and what's sometimes termed a parameter sweep, um, uh, or where we draw these parameter values from a distribution what are called Monte Carlo um, sensitivity analysis. And we'll see that those induce variability in the outcomes of the model that are different from what we get from stochastics alone. Often they're larger than what we get for stochastics alone. And, um, and where that variability induced by a given parameter may be quite different in magnitude and in character from parameter to parameter, but that's for next time, okay? Um, so uh, thank you uh, very much. Uh, hope this gives you a bit of a glimpse on um, some of the ways that we deal with stochastics and models. And I will note that this lecture um, plus these lectures on sensitivity analysis and potentially the lecture of calibration maybe of a value to you in your projects. And I'd be glad to engage with project teams to discuss how these ideas can be leveraged for your projects. And with those words, I'll close this lecture and open it up for office hours. Thank you for accommodating my needs on Tuesday and I look forward to engaging.